Chapter 3 It must have been some imp of the perverse, or some sardonic pull from dark, hidden sources, which made me change my plans as I did. I had long before resolved to limit my observations to architecture alone, and I was even then hurrying toward the square in an effort to get quick transportation out of this festering city of death and decay. But the sight of old Zadok Allen set up new currents in my mind, and made me slacken my pace uncertainly. I had been assured that the old man could do nothing but hint at wild, disjointed, and incredible legends, and I had been warned that the natives made it unsafe to be seen talking with him. Yet the thought of this aged witness to the town's decay, with memories going back to the early days of ships and factories, was a lure that no amount of reason could make me resist. After all, the strangest and maddest of myths are often merely symbols or allegories based upon truth, and old Zadok must have seen everything which went on around Innsmouth for the last ninety years. Curiosity flared up beyond sense and caution, and in my youthful egotism I fancied I might be able to sift a nucleus of real history from the confused, extravagant outpouring I would probably extract with the aid of raw whiskey. I knew that I could not accost him then and there, for the fireman would surely notice and object. Instead, I reflected I would prepare by getting some bootleg liquor at a place where the grocery boy had told me it was plentiful. Then I would loaf near the fire station in apparent casualness, and fall in with old Zadok, after he had started on one of his frequent rambles. The youth said that he was very restless, seldom sitting around that station for more than an hour or two at a time. A quart bottle of whiskey was easily, though not cheaply, obtained in the rear of a dingy variety store just off the square in Elliott Street. The dirty-looking fellow who waited on me had a touch of the staring Innsmouth look, but was quite civil in his way being perhaps used to the custom of such convivial strangers, truckmen, gold buyers, and the like, as were occasionally in town. Re-entering the square, I saw that luck was with me, for, shuffling out of Payne Street around the corner of the Gilman House, I glimpsed nothing less than the tall, lean, tattered form of old Zadok Allen himself. In accordance with my plan, I attracted his attention by brandishing my newly purchased bottle and soon realized that he had begun to shuffle wistfully after me as I returned into Waite Street on my way to the most deserted region I could think of. I was steering my course by the map the grocery boy had prepared, and was aiming for the wholly abandoned stretch of southern waterfront which I had previously visited. The only people in sight there had been the fishermen on the distant breakwater, and by going a few squares south I could get beyond the range of these, finding a pair of seats on some abandoned wharf, and being free to question old Zadok unobserved for an indefinite time. Before I reached Main Street, I could hear a faint and wheezy, Hey, mister, behind me, and I presently allowed the old man to catch up and take copious pulls from the quart bottle. I began putting out feelers as we walked along to Water Street and turned southward amidst the omnipresent desolation and crazily tilted ruins, but found that the aged tongue did not loosen as quickly as I had expected. At length I saw a grass-grown opening toward the sea between crumbling brick walls, with the weedy length of an earth and masonry wharf projecting beyond. Piles of moss-covered stones near the water promised tolerable seats, and the scene was sheltered from all possible view by a ruined warehouse on the north. Here, I thought, was the ideal place for a long secret colloquy, so I guided my companion down the lane and picked out spots to sit in among the mossy stones. The air of death and desertion was ghoulish, and the smell of fish almost insufferable, but I was resolved to let nothing deter me. About four hours remained for conversation if I were to catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham, and I began to dole out more liquor to the ancient tippler, meanwhile eating my own frugal lunch. In my donations I was careful not to overshoot the mark, for I did not wish Zadok's vinous garrulousness to pass into a stupor. After an hour his furtive taciturnity shewed signs of disappearing, but, much to my disappointment, he still sidetracked my questions about Innsmouth and its shadow-haunted past. He would babble of current topics, revealing a wide acquaintance with newspapers and a great tendency to philosophize 
in a sententious village fashion. Toward the end of the second hour, I feared my quart of whiskey would not be enough to produce results, and was wondering whether I had better leave old Zadok and go back for more. Just then, however, a chance made the opening which my questions had been able to make, and the wheezing, ancient rambling took a turn that caused me to lean forward and listen alertly. My back was toward the fishy-smelling sea, but he was facing it, and something or other had caused his wandering gaze to light on the low, distant line of Devil Reef, then shooing plainly and almost fascinatingly above the waves. The sight seemed to displease him, for he began a series of weak curses, which ended in a confidential whisper and a knowing leer. He bent toward me, took hold of my coat lapel, and hissed out some hints that could not be mistaken. That's where it all begun, that cursed place of all wickedness, where the deep water starts. Gate of hell, sheer drop down to a bottom no sound in line can touch. Old Captain Obed done it, him that found out more than was good for him in the South Sea Isles. Everybody was in a bad way them days. Trade fallen off. Mills losing business, even the new ones, and the best of our men's folk killed the privateering in the war eighteen twelve, or lost with the Elysee bringing the ranger snow, and both of them killed inventors. Obed Marsh he had three ships afloat, Brigantine Columbia, Brig Harry, and Bark Sumatri Queen. He was the only one that kept on with Ethingy and Pacific trade. Though his Driss Martin's barkentine belay pride made venter as late as twenty-eight. Never was nobody like Captain Obed, old limb of Satan. <laughs> I can mind him a tellin' about firm parts, and callin' all the folks stupid for going to Christian meetin' and bearin' their burdens meek and lowly. Says they'd order good, better gods like some of the folks in the Injies. Gods as would bring em good fishin in return for their sacrifices, and I'd really answer folks's prayers. Matt Elliot, his first mate, talked a lot too, from he was agin folks doin any heathen things, told about an island east o' Tahiti, where they was a lot of stone ruins older than anybody knew anything about, kind of like them on Bonape in the Carolines but with carvings of faces that looked like the big statues on Easter Island. There was a little volcanic island near thar too, where there was other ruins with different carvings, ruins all wore away like they'd been under the sea once, and with pictures of awful monsters all over em. Well, sir, Marty says the natives around thar had all the fish they could catch, and sported bracelets and armlets and head rigs made out of a queer kind of gold and covered with pictures of monsters just like the ones carved over the ruins on the little island. Sort of fish-like frogs, or frog-like fishes that was drawn in all kinds of positions like they was human beings. Nobody could get out of them where they got all the stuff, and all the other natives wondered how they managed to find fish in plenty even when the very next islands had been biggins. Matt, he got a wandering too, and sort of got Mobed. Mobed, he notices besides that lots of the handsome young folks had dropped out of sight for good from year to year, and that they wasn't many old folks around. Also, he thinks some of the folks look darn queer, even for Kanakis. It took Obed to get the truth out of them, heathen. I didn't know I'd done it, but he begun by trading for the gold-like things they wore, asked them where they come from, and if they could get more, and finally wormed the story out the old chief, Wallachia, they called him. Nobody but Obed had ever believed the old yellow devil, but the captain could read folks like they was books. <laughs> Nobody never believes me now when I tell them, and I don't suppose you will, young feller. No come to look at you. You have kind of got them sharp reading eyes, like Obed had. The old man's whisper grew fainter, 
and I found myself shuddering at the terrible and sincere portentousness of his intonation, even though I knew his tale could be nothing but drunken fantasy. Well, sir, I bet he learnt that there's things on this earth as most folks never hear about, and wouldn't believe if they did hear. It seems these Kanakis were sacrificing heaps of their young men and maidens to some kind of god things that lived under the sea and getting all kinds of favor in return. They met the things on the little island with the queer ruins, and it seems them awful pictures of frogfish monsters was supposed to be pictures of these things. Maybe they was the kind of critters as got all the mermaid stories and such started. They had all kinds of cities on the sea bottom, and this island was heaved up from there. Seems they was some of the things alive in the stone buildings when the island come up sudden to the surface. That's how the Kanakis got wind that it was down there. Made sign talk as soon as they got over being scared, and pieced up a bargain afore long. Them things liked human sacrifices, had them ages before, but lost track of the upper world at our time. What they done to the victims it ain't for me to say, and I guess Obed want none too sharp about asking. But it was all right with the heathens because they'd been having a hard time and was desperate about everything. They'd give a certain number of young folks to the sea things twixt every year, May Eve and Halloween, regular as could be. Also give some of the carved knick-knacks they made. What the things agreed to give in return was plenty of fish. They drove them in from all over the sea, and a few gold-like things now and then. Well, as I says... The natives met the things on the little volcanic islet, going there in canoes with the sacrifices, etc., and bringing back in near the gold like jewels as was coming to them. At first, the things did never go on to the main island, but order a time they come to want to. Seems they hankered out of mixing with the folks and having gent ceremonies on the big days, May Eve and Halloween. You see, they was able to live both in and out the water, what they call amphibians, I guess. The Kanakis told them as how folks from the other islands might want to wipe them out if they got wind of their being there. But they says they didn't care much because they could wipe out the whole brood of humans if they was willing to bother. That is, Aeneas didn't have certain signs such as was used once by the lost old ones, whoever they was, but not wanting to bother they'd lay low when anybody visited the island. When it came to maiden with them toad-looking fishies, the Kanakis kind of balked, but finally they learned something as put a new face on the matter. Seems that human folks has got a kind of relation to such water beasts, that everything alive came out of the water once, and only needs a little change to go back again. Them things told the Kanakis that if they mixed bloods, There'd be children as it look human at first, but later turn more and more like the things, till finally they'd take to the water and join the main lot of things down thar. And this is the important part, young fella. Them as turned into the fish things and went into the water would never die. Ten things never died except they was killed violent. Well, sir. It seems by the time Obed knowed them islanders, they was all full of fish blood from them deep water things. When they got old and begun to shoot, it, they kept by hid until they felt like talking to the water and quitting the place. Some was more touched than others, and some never did change quite enough to take to the water, but mostly they turned out just the way them things say. Them as was born more like the things changed early, but them as was nearly human sometimes stayed on the island till they was past seventy, though they'd usually go down under for trial trips before that. Folks as had took to the water generally come back a good deal of it, so as a man that often be a talking to his own five times great grandfather, who'd left the dry land a couple of hundred years or so before. Everybody got out of the idea of dying except in canoe wars with the other islanders, or as sacrifices to the sea gods down below, or from snake bite or plague, or 
sharp galloping ailments or something afore they could take to the water, but simply looked forward to a kind of change that one not a bit horrible arter a while. I thought what they'd got was well worth all they'd had to give up, and I guess Obed kind of come to think the same himself when he chewed over old Wallachia's story a bit. Wallachia, though, was one of the few that hadn't gotten on the fish blood, being of a royal line that intermarried with royal lines on other islands. Wallachia, he showed Obed a lot of rites and incantations that had to do with sea things, and let him see some of the hoax in the village as had changed a lot from human shape. Somehow or other, though, he never would let him see one of the regular things from right out of the water. In the end, he gave him a funny kind of thingamajig made out of lead or something that he said would bring up the fish things from any place in the water where there might be a nest of them. The idea was to drop it down with the right kind of prayers and such. Voila care loud as the things were scattered all over the world. And so as anybody that looked about could find a nest and bring them up if they was wanted. Matt, he didn't like this business at all and wanted Obed should keep away from the island. But Captain was sharp for gain, and found he could get them gold-like things so cheap it'd pay him to make a specialty of them. Things went on that way for years, and Obed got enough of that gold-like stuff to make him start the refinery to wait old run-down fueling mill. He didn't ask to sell the pieces like they was, for folks would all be all the time asking questions. All the same as crews would get a piece and dispose of it now and then, even though they was swore to keep quiet. And he let his women folk wear some of the pieces, as was more human-like than most. Well, come about thirty-eight. When I was seven year old, Obed he found the island people all wiped out between voyages. Seems the other islanders had got wind of what was going on, and had took matters into their own hands. Suppose they must have had arter all them old magic signs and sea things says was the only things they was afeard of. No telling what any of them kanakis will chance to get a hold of when the sea bottom throws up some island with ruins old in the deluge. Pious cusses these was. They didn't leave nothing standing on either the main island or the little volcanic islet, except what parts of the ruins was too big to knock down. In some places, there was little stones strewed about like charms, with something on them like what you call a swastika nowadays. Probably them was the old one's signs. Folks all wiped out, no trace of no gold-like things, and none of the nearby Kanakis had breathed a word about the matter. Wouldn't even admit there'd ever been any people on that island. That naturally hit old bed pretty hard seeing as his normal trade was doing very poor. It hit the whole Innsmouth, too, because in seafaring days, what profit of the master of ship generally profit of the crew proportionate. Most of the folks around the town took the hard times, kind of sheep-like and resigned, but they was in bad shape because the fishing was petering out and the mills weren't doing nothing too well. And the time Obed he begun a cursing at the folks for being dull sheep and praying to a Christian heaven it didn't help him none. He told him he'd know the folks as pray to gods that gives something you really need and says if a good bunch of men would stand by him he could maybe get a hold of sartin powers that would bring plenty of fish and quite a bit of gold. Of course they was served on the Sumatra Queen and seed the island knowed what he meant and weren't none too anxious to get close to see things like they'd hear tell on. But them as didn't know what was all about, got kind of swayed by what Obed had to say, and begun to ask him what he could do to set him on the way to faith, as it'd bring him results. Here the old man faltered, mumbled, and lapsed into a moody and apprehensive silence glancing nervously over his shoulder and then turning back to stare fascinatedly at the distant black reef. When I spoke to him, he did not answer, so I knew I would have to let him finish the bottle. The insane yarn I was hearing interested me profoundly, for I fancied there was contained within it a sort of crude allegory based upon the strangenesses of Innsmouth and elaborated by an imagination at once creative and full of scraps of exotic legend. 
Not for a moment did I believe that the tale had any really substantial foundation, but nonetheless the account held a hint of genuine terror, if only because it brought in references to strange jewels clearly akin to the malign tiara that I had seen at Newburyport. Perhaps the ornaments had, after all, come from some strange island, and possibly the wild stories were lies of the bygone Obed himself, rather than of his antique toper. I handed Zadok the bottle, and he drained it to the last drop. It was curious how he could stand so much whiskey, for not even a trace of thickness had come into his high, wheezy voice. He licked the nose of the bottle and slipped it into his pocket, then, beginning to nod and whisper softly to himself, I bent close to catch any articulate words he might utter, and thought I saw a sardonic smile behind the stained, bushy whiskers. Yes, he was really forming words, and I could grasp a fair proportion of them. Poor Matt. That he always was again it. Tried to line up the folks on his side and had long talks with the preachers. No use. They run the Congregational Parson out to town, and the Methodist feller quit. Never did see Resolve Babcock the Baptist Parson again. Or at the Jehovah, I was a mighty little critter. But I heard what I heard and seen what I seen. Dagon and Ashtoreth, Belial and Beelzebub, Golden Calf and the idols of Canaan and the Philistines, Babylonish abominations, many, many take Mulufarsen. He stopped again, and from the look in his watery blue eyes I feared he was close to a stupor after all. But when I gently shook his shoulder, he turned on me with astonishing alertness and snapped out some more obscure phrases. Don't believe me, eh? <laughs> and just tell me, young feller, why Captain Mobed and twenty-odd other folks used to row out to Devil Reef in the dead of night and chant things so loud you could hear them all over town when the wind was right. Tell me that, eh? And tell me why Obed was all this dropping heavy things down in the deep water to other side of the reef, where the bottom shoots down like a cliff lower and you can sound. Tell me what he done with that funny-shaped lead thingamajig as well I care give him. Hey, boy, and what did they all howl on May Eve, and again the next Halloween? And why'd the new church parsons, fellers as used to be sailors, wear them queer robes and cover themselves with gold-like things? Obed throng, eh? The watery blue eyes were almost savage and maniacal now, and the dirty white beard bristled electrically. Old Zadok probably saw me shrink back, for he began to cackle evilly. <laughs> Beginning to see, eh? Maybe I'd like to have been many in them days, when I'd seed things at night about to see from the couple o' top of my house. Oh, I can tell you little bitches that big ears, and I wasn't missing nothing of what was gossiped about Cap Mobed and the folks out to the reef. <laughs> How about the night I took my pa's ship glass up to the cupolo and seed the reef a bristling thick with shapes that dove off quick soon's the moonrise? Oh, bad and the folks was in a dory, but them shapes dove off the far side of the deep water and never come up. How'd you like to be a little shaver alone up in the cupola, a watching shapes as was in human shapes? <laughs> the old man was getting hysterical, and I began to shiver with a nameless alarm. He laid a gnarled claw on my shoulder, and it seemed to me that its shaking was not altogether that of mirth. Suppose one night you seed something heavy heave off an Obed's door beyond the reef, and then long the next day a young feller was missing from home. Eh? Did anybody ever see Hyde or Hare or Hiram Gilman again? Did they? And Nick Pierce and Llewelly Waite and Adoniram Southwick and Henry Garrison? <laughs> Shapes talk in sign language with their hands. They was had real hands. Well, sir, that was the time Obed begun to get on his feet again. 
folks see his three daughters wearing gold-like things as nobody'd never seen on them before, and smoke started coming out of the refinery chimney. Other folks was prospering too. Fish begun to swarm into the harbor fit to kill, and heaven knows what size cargoes we began to ship out to Newburyport, Arkham, and Boston. Twas then Obed got the old branch railroad put through. Some Kingsport fishermen heard about the kitch and came up in sloops, but they was all lost. Nobody never see him again. And just then our folks organized the esoteric order of Dagon and bought Masonic Hall off in Calvary Commandery for it. <laughs> Matt Elliott was a mason, and again the ceiling, but he dropped out of sight just then. Remember, I ain't saying Obed was set on having things just like there was on that gunnicky side. I don't think he aimed at for us to do no mixing, nor raise no young'uns to take to the water and turn to fishes with a turn alive. He had one of them gold things, and was willing to pay heavy, and I guess the others was satisfied for a while. Come in 46, the town done some looking and thinking for itself. Too many folks missing. Too much wild preaching at meeting on a Sunday. Too much talk about that reef. I guess I done a bit by telling Selectman Maori what I seen from the cupolo. They was a party one night as followed Obed's crowd out to the reef, and I heard shots betwixt the dories. Next day Obed and thirty-two others was in jail, with everybody a wondering just what was afoot and just what charge again em could be got to hold. God, if anybody'd looked ahead, a couple of weeks later, when nothing had been thrown into the sea for that long. Zadok was shooing signs of fright and exhaustion, and let him keep silence for a while, though glancing apprehensively at my watch. The tide had turned and was coming in now, and the sound of the waves seemed to arouse him. I was glad of that tide, for at high water the fishy smell might not be so bad. Again I strained to catch his whispers. That awful night I seed em. I was up in the couple of hordes of em, swarms of em, all over the reef and swimming up the harbor into the manuset. God, what happened in the streets Innsmouth that night? They rattled our door with Bob wouldn't open. Then he clumb out the kitchen window with his musket to find Selectman Maori and see what he could do. Mounds of the dead and the dying, shots and screams, shouting an old squire and town squire and new church green, jail throwed open, proclamation, treason, called it the plague when folks came in and found half our people missing. Nobody left but them as a gin with the opet, and them things, or else keep quiet. Never hear to my pa no more. The old man was panting and perspiring profusely, his grip on my shoulder tightened. Everything cleaned up in the morning, but they was traces. Obed, he kinder takes charge and says things is going to be changed. Others will worship with us at meeting time, and certain houses has got to entertain guests. They wanted to mix like they done with the Kanakis, and he for one didn't feel bound to stop em. Far gone was Obed, just like a crazy man on the subject. He says they brung us fish and treasure, and should have what they hankered after. Nothing was to be different on the outside. Only we was to keep shy of strangers if we knowed what was good for us. We all had to take the oath of Dagon, and later on they was second and third those that some of us took. Them as it helped special it'd get special rewards, gold and such. And no use barking, for there was millions of them down thar. They'd rather not start rising and wiping about mankind. But if they was gave away and forced to, they could do a lot that were just that. We didn't have them old charms to cut them off, like folks in the South Sea did. And them Kanakis would never give away their secrets. Yield up enough sacrifices and savage knick-knacks and hard bridge in the town when they wanted it. 
and they'd let well enough alone. Wouldn't bother no strangers as might bear tales outside. That is, without they got prying. All in the band of the faithful order a day gone. And the children should never die, but go back to the mother Hydra and father Dagon, what we call from want. Ya, ya, Cthulhu Vlagen, Langley, Vlagan, the Tafin, Cthulhu Vare, or Glad Nagel Vlagen. Old Zadok was fast lapsing into stark raving, and I held my breath. Poor old soul. To what pitiful depths of hallucination had his liquor, plus his hatred of the decay, alienage and disease around him brought that fertile imaginative brain he began to moan now and tears were coursing down his channeled cheeks into the depths of his beard god what i seen since i was fifteen years old men they men they take glufars and the folks as was missing and them as killed themselves them as told things in arkham or ipswich or such places was all called crazy like you're a calling me right now. But God, what I seen. They'd a killed me long ago, for what I know. Only I took the first and second oaths of Dagon off an obit, so was protected unless a jury of them proved I told things known and deliberate. But I wouldn't take the third oath. I'd a died rather than take that. It got worse around Civil War time, when children born since 46 begun to grow up. Some of them, that is. I was afeard. Never did no Brian arter that awful night, and never seen one of them close to in all my life. That is, never no full-blooded one. I went to the war, and if I'd had any guts or sense, I'd have never come back, but settled away from here. And folks wrote me things one so bad. That, I suppose was because government draft men was in town after 63. Out of the war, it was just as bad again. People began to fall off. Mills and shops shut down. Shipping stopped and the harbor choked up. Railroad give up, but they... They never stopped swimming in and out of the river from that cursed reef of Satan. And more and more attic winders got aboard it up. And more and more noises was here in houses as weren't supposed to have nobody in them. Folks outside have their stories about us. Suppose you hear to plenty of them, seeing what questions you asked. Stories about things they've seen now and then, and about that queer jewelry that still comes in from some Mars and ain't quite all melted up. But nothing never gets definite. Nobody'll believe nothing. They call them gold-like things pirate loot. And allow the Innsmouth folks his fur and blood, or his distempered or something. Besides them that lives here, shoo off as many strangers as they kin, and encourage the rest not to get very curious, especially round night time. Beasts balk at the critters. Hosses wore some mules, but when they got autos, that was all right. In '46, Cap Mobed took a second wife, that nobody in the town never see. Some says he didn't want to, but was made to by them as he'd called in. Had three children by her. Two was disappeared young, but one gal as looked like anybody else and was educated in Europe. Obed finally got her married off by a trick to an Arkham feller as didn't suspect nothing. But nobody outside will have nothing to do with Innsmouth folks now. Barnabas Marsh that runs the old refinery now is... Obed's grandson by his first wife, son of Onesiphorus, his eldest son. But his mother was another of them as want never seed outdoors. Right now, Barnabas is about changed, can't shed his eyes no more, and is all about a shape. They say he still wears clothes, but he'll take to water soon. Maybe he's tried it already. They do sometimes go down for little spells before they go for good. Ain't been said about in public for nigh on ten year. Didn't know how his poor wife can feel. She come from Ipswich, and then I lynched Barnabas when he courted her fifty odd year ago. Oh, bet he died in seventy eight, and all the next generation is gone now. The first wife's children dead, and the rest. 
God knows. The sound of the incoming tide was now very insistent, and little by little it seemed to change the old man's mood from maudlin tearfulness to watchful fear. He would pause now and then to renew those nervous glances over his shoulder or out toward the reef, and despite the wild absurdity of his tale, I could not help beginning to share his vague apprehensiveness. Zadok now grew shriller and seemed to be trying to whip up his courage with louder speech. Hey, you, why don't you say something? How'd ye like to be living in a town like this, with everything a-rotten and a-dying and boarded-up monsters crawling and bleating and barking and hopping around black cellars and attics every way you turn? Hey, how'd ye like to hear the howl at night arter night from the churches and order a day gone hull and know what's doing part of the howling? How'd ye like to hear what comes from that awful reef every May Eve in Alamas? Hey, think the old man's crazy, eh, well, sir? Let me tell you, that ain't the worst. Zadok was really screaming now, and the mad frenzy of his voice disturbed me more than I care to own. Curse ya! Don't set that star starin' at me with them eyes. I tell Obed Marsh he's in hell, and he's got to stay thar. In hell, I says. Can't get me. I ain't done nothing, nor told anybody nothing. Oh, you, young feller, well... Even if I hadn't told nobody nothing yet, I'm a-going to now. You just sat still and listen to me, boy. This is what I ain't never told nobody. I says I didn't do no prying order that night. But I found things out just the same. You want to know what the real horror is, eh? Well, it's this. It ain't what them fish devils has done, but what they're a-going to do. They're bringing things up out the war where they come from into the town, been doing it for years and slacking them up lately. Them, them houses north of the river betwixt water and main streets is full of them, them devils and what they brung, and when they get ready, I say when they get ready, ever hear tell of a shoggoth? Hey, do you hear me? I tell you, I know what them things be. I seen them one night when... Uh, 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 the hideous suddenness and inhuman frightfulness of the old man's shriek almost made me faint. His eyes, looking past me toward the malodorous sea, were positively starting from his head, while his face was a mask of fear worthy of Greek tragedy. His bony claw dug monstrously into my shoulder, and he made no motion as I turned my head to look at whatever he had glimpsed. There was nothing that I could see. Only the incoming tide, with perhaps one set of ripples more local than the long-flung line of breakers. But now Zadok was shaking me, and I turned back to watch the melting of that fear-frozen face into a chaos of twitching eyelids and mumbling gums. Presently his voice came back, albeit as a trembling whisper. Get out of here! Get out of here! They've seen us! Get out for your life! Don't wait for nothing. They know now. Run for it, quick. Out of this town. Another heavy wave dashed against the loosening masonry of the bygone wharf and changed the mad ancient's whisper to another inhuman and blood-curdling scream. Yeah, ah. Before I could recover my scattered wits, he had relaxed his clutch on my shoulder and dashed wildly inland toward the street, reeling northward against the ruined warehouse wall. I glanced back at the sea, but there was nothing there, and I reached Water Street and looked along it toward the north. There was no remaining trace of Zadok Allen.